We have been working our way through this incredible story uh, that is told from the first hand account of the Apostle John. We find that in this in this gospel that John tells, he refers to himself in a very unique way. He calls himself the one that Jesus loved, or the disciple that Jesus loved. And it's important that I remind you of that often because when a person tells a story, it's good to know their reference. It's good to know their frame of their, their frame of mind. It's good to know kind of where they're coming from. I don't know if you've ever sat down with somebody and said, you know, like, hey, so-and-so, what's your name or what's your story or whatever. It's hard to connect with somebody when you don't know, you know, like, what, what town did you grow up in? Like, what kind of people did you run with? Like, what kind of experiences have you had? But once you begin to hear those things and once somebody begins to explain to you kind of the details of their life, what happens to you typically? Don't you begin to automatically begin to feel that connection? It's, it's easier that way. You begin to relate to them. You, be able to, you begin to kind of put yourself in their shoes and go, oh yeah, you came from this place. Hey, I came from a place not, not too far from there. And you begin to build relationship. So when we read through the Gospel of John and he makes this statement about himself that he is the disciple that Jesus loved or the one that Jesus loved, and that's the way he refers to himself, we, we get to understand that where he's coming from is he's not coming from a place where he looked at himself as left out. He's not looking at himself as somebody who Jesus didn't notice. He's not looking at himself as somebody who didn't matter. But he's actually talking from his story saying, I knew Jesus. I loved Jesus and I know Jesus loved me. There was an intimate connection that I had with Jesus. And so when I tell you my story, I want you to know that I'm not trying to spin something to make me seem better than I am. How many of you guys know that we're professionals at trying to impress people, especially when we just meet them, right? It's like, I don't know you, so I'm going to make myself seem way bigger than I really am or whatever. He's saying, I don't need to impress you. I don't need to spin anything because I know who I am because Jesus told me who I am. And so we've been going through his gospel, and we're almost to the end of it. It's been a really, really crazy journey for me as a teacher just to read through the different stories and the different miracles and everything. And so tonight, um, we're going to come to chapter 18 in the book of John, and I want to read to you the, the introduction to it. It says in verse 1, after saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples, and he entered a grove of olive trees. Judas the betrayer knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, Jesus asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. Jesus did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those that you have given me. And then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus, and they tied him up. This is the story of Jesus being arrested. This is the part that as we've been unfolding John's gospel, as we've been talking about the story of God and how God has been masterfully laying out the details of the story, this is the part of the story where things begin to change for Jesus in a very, very, very real way. One of the things that 
we see about this encounter, it says, John says, that Jesus fully realized everything that was about to happen. Jesus was not surprised. Jesus was ready. Jesus was prepared. Jesus knew in advance everything that was going to take place. The reason is because as we have been reading through the Gospel of John, we have been seeing every single time that Jesus has modeled for us how to do his spiritual prep work. Jesus did the spiritual prep that he needed to be able to go into this situation where his game was about to change like no other time in his life, but he was ready for it and he fully realized everything that was about to take place. He was prepared because he was prepped. Now this story starts, the very first word that we read about this story is it says, after saying these things, Jesus crossed over the Kidron Valley. After saying these things, what was Jesus saying? We got to go back several weeks in our journey together and recap everything that was taking place in the lives of Jesus and his followers. Several weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus began to gather his disciples together in a room and he quarantined them together. He says, guys, I've got to get you close together and I've got to lay some things out for you so that you will understand some of the deepest truths about the kingdom of God that you've ever been exposed to. And I've got to get you ready for what's about to take place. And so Jesus says, in order for me to prepare your hearts for what I'm about to teach you, I have to show you something first. And so Jesus goes over to the servant boy in the room and he says, give me the bowl. Give me the bowl of water, the bowl of water that is reserved for the lowest person in the room. I want you to give me that bowl of water that is reserved for the person in this room who is supposed to wash the feet of every person that enters this house. Jesus says, give me the bowl. And he gets down on his hands and knees and he takes the bowl of water and he tells his followers, now each of you come to me and let me clean your dirty toes. Let me scrub the grime off of your feet. And they freaked out. They're just like, there's no way, Jesus, that you are going to let, you're not going to wash our feet. We will not let you do it. We will wash your feet, but you'll never wash our feet. And Jesus says, if you don't let me wash you, you'll never get what I'm trying to give you. You've got to understand that everything I'm about to teach you in this session starts with you understanding that the kingdom of God starts with a servant getting low, willing to serve everybody else. After Jesus washes his feet, I want to I share with you a little snippet of what we read several weeks ago. It says in John chapter 13, after Jesus washed their feet, he said this, Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other wondering whom he could mean. The disciple that Jesus loved, John, was sitting next to Jesus at the table. And Simon Peter motioned to him and asked, who's he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? And Jesus responded, it is the one who I give the bread to after I dip it in the bowl. This is what we do every week. And when he dipped it, Jesus gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered him. And then Jesus told Judas, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the, other, none of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was the treasurer, some thought Jesus was just telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come. I want you guys to wrap your heads around what is happening in the life of Jesus right now. He's got a room like this, but it was probably smaller and there was less people there. And he knows 
things are about to change for me, and I have to get my message to the hearts of these people. He gets down and he lowers himself and he washes their feet. And all the while he knows the man that is about to stab me in the back is in this room. And he tells Judas, come here, let me wash your feet. Jesus Jesus gets down before anybody else in the room knows what's about to take place. And he tells his betrayer who he knows ahead of time what he's going to do. And he says, Judas, let me wash your feet. It unfolds at the table where Jesus makes this public revelation to everybody. He says, somebody in this room is going to sell me out. Somebody in this room is going to do me dirty. Somebody in this room is going to take me down. And everybody in the room starts freaking out. They're just like, is it me? Is it me? Oh, crap. Is it me? I don't know who this is. Jesus lays out who it's going to be to one person. He tells John, he says, watch the bread. Watch the bread, and whoever I give the bread to, that's, this, this is the clue of who it's going to be. And Jesus tells Judas, go and do what you have to do. As soon as Judas leaves, this blows my mind. As soon as Judas leaves the room, I want you guys to think about this for a second. Imagine in this room, somebody stands up, and I tell him, you know what? I know who you are, and I know what you're all about, and I know what you're about to do. You're about to do something that's going to hurt me and my family. Go and do what you got to do. And this person gets up right here in the middle of church and walks out. I want to tell you guys, my heart would be racing. My heart would be pounding. I would be sweating. I'd be so mad. I'd be just like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that dude's going to go do what he's going to go do. The last thing in the world I would be ready to do is preach to you. My head would be in a whole different place. But you know what Jesus does? Jesus begins to teach them, starting with the agape love of God. He says, now my betrayer is out of the room. I need to get this to you. He talks about the peace of God. He talks about being pruned by God and going through the fire and how through the pruning process is where you will discover what true joy is. Nobody wants to be pruned. Nobody wants to get cut. It hurts too bad. And yet Jesus says, this is where you will find the true joy is through this cutting process. He talks about how all this is possible. Jesus says, all of this is possible, the love, the peace, the joy, because I am getting ready to leave and I am about to send my spirit. And he says, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills you, you will begin to operate in the same power that I am operating in right now, standing before you, knowing I'm being betrayed at this very moment and being able to get out of the way and give you the message of God instead. How was Jesus able to do this? How was he able to evacuate himself from his emotions and focus on the higher purpose of God? How was he able to distance himself from all of his human emotions and rationale and wanting to take matters into his own hands? It was because of one thing and one thing only. Because Jesus, all through the Gospel of John, has been modeling for us what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not to walk after the things of the flesh that are weak and never produce the fruit. But to learn how to say, Lord, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Every step, Jesus is modeling us out until we come to this crescendo in his story. I can't think of a more painful thing. I can't think of a more painful thing than to have somebody who was that close to me, who I trusted with the very money of the church, to do what he did. And yet in the moment, Jesus says, this isn't just about me. 
This is for the kingdom. This is for me to model for my brothers and sisters at Gravity Church over 2,000 years later what it looks like to respond by the power of God's spirit when you get betrayed by someone. In the gospel of Matthew, Matthew was there and he saw this whole thing go down. He was in the garden when they came and Matthew says it like this. He says, the traitor... Judas had given them a prearranged signal. He said, you will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight up to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and he gave him the kiss. What does Jesus do? Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. In this garden, we see that this interaction between Jesus and Judas was not some distant person that didn't have connection or relationship. We see that there was intimacy because you didn't in their culture just walk up to a stranger and kiss him on the cheek. Only brothers did that. Only those that knew each other closely did that. Only those that had that kind of connection did that. See, this was a personal betrayal. This was not some distant thing. This was personal. They knew each other. They loved each other. People have called it the Judas kiss ever since I was a kid. I can remember hearing people talk about the Judas kiss. What it means when somebody that you love comes up and and betrays you and sells you out. How does Jesus respond? We see how Jesus responded before he was betrayed. He washed his betrayer's feet. How does Jesus respond during the middle of his betrayal? He greets him with a kiss and calls him friend. How is Jesus able to do this? There's only one way. I will tell it to you over and over and over again. For you to step out of the realm of the natural and step into your birthplace of the supernatural where the spirit of God has power to give you what you do not possess in and of yourself. Jesus says, because of my spirit within you, you literally can look at one of the life's hardest things and see it completely different. Why was Jesus able to do this? Why was Jesus able to see it this way? Because Jesus never lost sight of his father's business Before his betrayal, during his betrayal, and after his betrayal, Jesus never took his eyes off of the harvest. Jesus knew that his father had a plan. Jesus knew that he had been sent to this dark world to bring light and redemption into it. And Jesus never took his eyes off the harvest. He always kept his eyes on what the father said to keep his eyes on. That's how we know in this story, we read that one of Jesus' followers, Peter, he knew how to handle a situation like this. Hey, you're coming to take out my boy? He pulls out his sword and slashes the ear off one of the dudes. He knew how to get down, and Jesus is just like, oh my gosh. Didn't see this part of the story playing out like this. Luke was there. Luke saw it too. And Luke told about it in his gospel. Matter of fact, Luke says, one of them struck at the high priest's slave and slashed off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And Jesus touched the man's ear and healed him. In the middle of his betrayal, he is still about the father's business. In the middle of his betrayal, he is still healing people. How is he able to do this? Because Jesus was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are right now, I know by how quiet, it is, how quiet it is in this room, you're thinking of all the people that have betrayed you. I know how, I know how much it hurts. And you're hearing this and you're watching this scriptures and you're, you're hearing me talk about Jesus and you're saying, yeah, but that was Jesus, okay? That wasn't me. Trust me, I've used that one a lot in my life. 
Let me tell you something. The promise. The promise that is given to the sons and the daughters of God is that you get everything in the kingdom. Last week we talked about how Jesus prayed for us. How after Jesus laid everything out, after Jesus knew he was being betrayed, at that very moment, he ended his session with his followers by praying. And in his prayer, he prayed for us here tonight. He prayed for our unity and our protection. And last week we talked about the links that Jesus went to to guarantee that we would never, ever, ever be torn apart. I tell you guys often, much of my story growing up was within the walls of churches. My father is a pastor. My grandfather is a pastor. I had the privilege of growing up in an environment that taught me about the word of God and about the ways of God. But I have to tell you, as I often say, that it also taught me about the politics within the four walls of the church. It often taught me about the things that happen that should not be done in the four walls of the church because of ego and pride and men's ambition to want to build an empire unto themselves rather than humble themselves as a slave and a servant to God to build God's kingdom around them. I've seen it so many, many, many times. I like to say that I am somewhat of an expert when it comes to church hurt. I've been hurt before and I've been around many, many people that have been hurt deeply by people within the church. But as I said last week, Jesus prayed for our unity and our protection because Jesus knew that the plan of the evil one was to divide us and destroy what God was doing here in this earth. And he knew that if he could get us to turn away from each other or to backbite against each other, that he could literally divide cities. He could literally divide cultures. He could literally divide nations because we would choose to disagree with each other over things that ought not be divided over. It's okay to disagree with me. You do not have to agree with everything that I believe or say, and you can still be my brother. You can still Worship with me. You can still understand that what unites us can never be torn apart. My friends, if there's anybody who's an expert on church hurt more than me, it's Jesus. See, he wasn't betrayed by somebody out there. He wasn't betrayed by somebody outside the four walls of the church. Jesus was betrayed by one of the guys up here. Jesus was betrayed by one of the ones that was saying the prayers and leading the songs and was telling you, hey, bring your money to the altar. I'll make sure we account for it perfectly. Jesus was betrayed by one of the chosen few that had the inside circle. And Jesus modeled for us what it looks like to take our eyes off of our own hurt and take our eyes and place them on the greater kingdom of God and say, God, this hurts so bad, but not my will. Your will be done in spite of this. God, I will not divide. I will not de destroy. I will find a way to come to terms with the understanding of what you are doing. Oh, don't get me wrong. There's people to this day that I don't ever want to talk to again. There's people in my life that have hurt me, and I have nothing nice to say to them. And I think my mom's the one that taught me that if you have nothing nice to say, just keep your mouth shut, right? I think that's in the Bible somewhere. Probably not, but it's a good one. But the greater truth is that even though I can't be in the same room as them because of what they've done to me, the greater truth is that I understand that we are still one in the kingdom and that God, who I trust more than my emotions, has the ability to discipline his children and correct things that are not right. And when I, as we read two weeks ago, entrust my worries to my father and trust that he is a good father that knows how to correct and bring discipline to his children, I can place my pain and my burden where they rightfully belong, at the feet of my father. I have lived long enough to see God bring justice 
to situations that were unjust. I've lived long enough to see God do things in his kingdom to bring correction. God is serious about his correction in his kingdom. God wants for us to be together. And I have seen God literally shut down entire churches because they were operating from a man prideful standpoint rather than from a humility kingdom standpoint. Don't think God doesn't have the ability to do what he wants to do. What is your role? What is my role? Number one, to understand you're going to get betrayed. No human being is going to escape this world without getting stabbed in the back a time or two or a hundred. You have to accept part of being a human is you're going to go through it. But the bigger thing is to make your choice right now, how are you going to respond? It's going to happen if it hasn't happened already. How are you going to respond? In the book of Hebrews chapter 2, it says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. It was necessary for Jesus to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. You're going to be hit. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be betrayed. Things are going to happen in your life. Sometimes like by the people that you thought were the closest to you. What are you going to do? How will you respond? My friends, there is only one response. When we find ourselves in that kind of a place of brokenness, of anguish, of not knowing how to handle it, we have one response, and it says it right here. He is able to help us when we are being tested, and our only response is to cry out and draw close to the Lord. It's, Lord, draw me close to your heart. Lord, bring me close to you, because God, you are the only anchor that can hold my life right now. Everything in my life is going all kinds of different places, but God, draw me close to you because you are the anchor that will hold me when everything feels like it has been destroyed and broken. I want you to close your eyes with me right now. In this place right now, there is enough heartbreak There is enough devastation. There is enough stories to go around to fill this room all night long of people who have been devastated and ravaged. But God wants me to tell you in this moment that you don't have to focus on the hurt. You can turn your focus towards him. But you have got to make the conscious choice right now to be able to come to that place where the focus of your existence right now begins to become around God, draw me close to you. Draw me close to you in this moment. Forgiveness is a word that we throw around a lot because it's the most important word in the kingdom of God. We have been forgiven, and so Jesus says, now I want you to be my instruments of forgiveness. Forgiveness is never one of those things that we like. It's never one of those things that comes easy, and yet it's one of those supernatural gifts that God has given to his people. It says, no matter what has happened to you, there is something stronger for you. No matter how you've been hurt, there is something stronger that will give you what you need in a time of brokenness and in a time of weakness. And in this place tonight, there's some people that need to forgive. You've been betrayed, you've been hurt, and it's time for you to be able to access the power of the Holy Spirit and say, tonight, God, I want to know a different way. 
I'm going to invite the prayer team to come on up here. If you're on any of our prayer teams, I want you to come up here to the front. Because there are some people tonight that need to pray about what's going on inside of their heart right now. See, forgiveness is one of those things where we, we, mix, we mix it up sometimes because we think that when we forgive, we're, we're giving permission or we're excusing something that someone else has done, and it's not about that at all. It's about coming to the place to where we recognize that the unforgiveness that I carry is keeping me from moving forward into the places that God has for me, from keeping me from moving forward into the areas that God wants to move through my life. God says, I want you to experience my freedom tonight. And it means it's time for you to let it go. It's time for you to move into the place that I have for you. I'm going to have Jeremiah just play some some music here for a moment as we take a moment to search our hearts. And if you need prayer, I want to invite you to come on up here right now. I want you to take a step of faith. I want you to take a step towards letting it go. We have this table set up where we read tonight that Jesus and his followers took the bread and dipped it in the juice. This is the place where we come to search our hearts and to remember everything that Christ has done for us. We're going to take a few moments right here and we're going to search our hearts and respond to what God has said in his word tonight. And then our brother's going to play some more of his music for us tonight. So don't rush out of here tonight. Hang out for a little longer so we can experience what God has given to Brother Jeremiah. But in this moment right now, if you need prayer, or if you need to come to this table, please, come. Stand up. Come on. Don't be shy. Come. 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 Come.